Good morning, welcome to everybody to the media editor panel session of the Synergy ESEMA Management Conference 2020. This is your, our first time that we go live and we are very excited about that. My name is Daniela Baglieri, I'm coming from the University of Messina and I'm going to chair this session which is going to be very exciting and very insightful time that uh, and we thank you let me thank you our panelists for making their time and join us in this session so please thank you for uh, Jochenham Altman editor-in-chief for European Management Review uh, Shlomo Tarbat the editor, editor-in-chief for British Journal Management Elisa Giuliani editor of research policy Reginish Narula editor journal of international business studies Alberto Di Menin, Associate Editor of R&D Management, Cleopatra Velofku, Editor of Journal Product Brand, and, uh, Brand Management, and Alfredo De Masis, Editor of Entrepreneurship Theory and Practice. So thank you again for making your time and for, your, uh, for sharing with us our, your experience, your tips, your testing knowledge about your editorial uh, prior experience. So, you know, publishing is very critical. As, you, as we know, as we experience in our career, publishing is very critical, but it's very, sometimes very tough. It's a long journey, and, but we, um, we need to care about that for several reasons. First of all, because creating impact for society, which is the topic of this conference, is very, uh, it's very useful and it's timely. So we need to create some valuable research in order to turn this research to creating better society. So how can we convey, how can we deliver? So publication can be one of these channels. So we need to care about that. And we need to also promote some ethical behavior about that. Because we know that also publication is at the crossroad of several careers, especially for the young people, for the young uh, colleagues that I hope are listening. So we need to promote, to guide them, to promote and to strengthen our national community. So publication is very, very critical. And we thank you uh, again, our panelists, because uh, I know that they, they want to share with us all these tips and also, and also to create some publication that can match, can fit, rigor and relevance. That's very useful. So. Uh, we, we try to uh, split the time that we, we have in two parts. The first part is just a brief introduction. Uh, I will be, uh, I try to control the time, only five minutes of introduction uh, of our panelists because we want to uh, interact with the audience. We, know, we, we, we want to create, so please start preparing the, the question that you can submit in our channel uh, and off chat on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook page. So let's start, let's kick off. Please, Yokohan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and greetings from London. Um, I'm under strict instruction to keep to time, and uh, so I'll be brief. Um, I was asked to provide some tips about publishing, and I chose two. The first one is the cover letter or cover note. Um, as you know, uh, the publishing process is basically um, jumping over hurdles. Uh, it's a long journey. And, and the first hurdle is quite, uh, quite a high one. Uh, and that's um, when your paper uh, lands on the desk, uh, metaphorically speaking, now everything is virtual, of course. Uh, on the desk of the editor, the editor-in-chief, because the editor needs to make a decision, which is a cardinal decision, whether uh, to pass on your paper for review or reject it, uh, what we call desk reject. Uh, and the question you have to ask yourself as a submitting author is, how can I increase my chances of passing to the review phase? In other words, not to be desk rejected. And here comes to play uh, the cover letter or cover note, which often uh, people, particularly uh, the younger scholar, uh, don't make uh, use of or good use of. You see, uh, you need to sell your paper. Now, in the paper itself, you are restricted of how much you can sell it because you have to adhere to uh, conventions. 
That includes the abstract, which is the first, if you like, uh, port that is seen. Um, you cannot oversell your paper in the abstract because you need to deliver it in the paper. Where you can try and oversell or really impress is in the cover note. So don't be shy about it. Uh, uh, when you submit a paper in the cover note to the editor, explain in detail why you think that your paper is the best thing since sliced bread and how uh, it uh, contributes to knowledge and why it is extremely practical and why it is of interest to this particular journal to publish it. And don't hesitate to uh, really be detailed about that. So that's the first thing uh, I wanted uh, to, to give as a tip. The other one, which is to an extent connected, um, is uh, plagiarism, and that includes self-plagiarism. Uh, beware of that as from fire, uh, because it's now standard practice that when you submit a paper, it goes through an automated um, similarity check. And the similarity check will detect whether your paper um, has already been published or grades parts of it, or presented in a conference and available online. That creates uh, a couple of complications. One, uh, you know, uh, most journals don't like uh, uh, to publish uh, material that is already in the public uh, domain. But there's also the issue of copyrights. In other words, uh, copyrights uh, legislation, and it is a bit vague, it is not clear cut, but copyrights legislation prevents you from uh, publishing the same material again because the intellectual copyrights are yours and you can use them as you see fit and how often you see fit. But the material copyrights belong to the publisher of the outfit that you published with, right? So be very careful about that. Um, don't overdo it. So that's my second tip. Um, I'm not sure how I'm about time, Daniela, but uh, I actually uh, finished my, 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 my deliberation for the moment. Daniela, your microphone. Uh Okay, yeah, only one minute. I got another minute. That's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, so let me link back then the, um, the second tip to the first one. So if you already published a paper in another outfit, then explain in the cover note why you are reusing some of the material. And if you are uh, using the same data set, which is normal practice where you try, if you have a large data set, you try to publish more than one paper of it. Try to explain why that does not, it's not the same. That paper you're submitting is not the same, is not quite the same as the one that already is published using similar material, uh, using, uh, you know, similar language and so on. Again, your chance to convince is in your uh, covering note uh, to your submission. Okay, Yoko, okay. thank you again. Thank you for your tips, thank cover you. letter, plagiarism. So they are very interesting and very uh, critical. So uh, now, uh, Slomo. So Slomo Tarba, uh, debitor, uh, deputy editor in British Journal Management. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, I don't want to be uh, repetitive. And in addition to the excellent and valid points raised by uh, Professor Johanan Altman, I would like to add a couple of things based on my experience. First of all, as a submitting author, later as a guest editor in many special issues in the leading journals in uh, international business and business strategy, I would say that one of the most critical things is the conceptual theoretical contribution that we are looking in British Journal of Management. And in this sense, the recency of your paper is absolutely vital. 
because if you are not able to articulate the novelty, the added value, in addition to the ongoing debate in our journal and other leading journals in the particular area, then obviously it dramatically reduces the chances of the paper. So it's not only the question of uh, whether your literature review is updated or not, it's how you actually articulate, how you elucidate the added value of your paper versus the existing knowledge in the field. In this sense, I have a couple of tips. First of all, I would suggest to look for a systematic review on that particular topic. If it exists, sometimes it doesn't exist, so you cannot find. Uh, based on my personal experience many years ago when I started my work on ambidexterity topic, uh, we have conducted with my colleagues, first of all, a comprehensive review. Later, we conducted a meta-analysis. It was the first ever published meta-analysis on ambidexterity. Uh, it was uh, published eventually in Academy of Management Perspectives. And that helped us to better realize what is the missing, what is missing exactly in the field, at what level of analysis. And this, how you can better articulate the added value in your own empirical papers, if you conducted, or if at least if you are aware of other systematic review and meta-analysis written by other colleagues. But that really helps to better realize the contribution for your own empirical papers. That is one tip. The second tip, today, I think it's very important to talk about enablers. It's not only today, of course, but today it's especially critical to talk about micro foundations of phenomena. Because in certain areas, especially in the international business, we can see a lot of studies that stay for already more than 25 years at the country level, at the regional level, but not going deeper into team, individual level. And I think it's really important to talk about the micro-foundational level. How, for example, agility, ambidexterity, or any other phenomena, how we can break them down into certain clear processes at the individual or team level. That can also bring about some novelty, some contribution. How I, how, in terms of the time constraints, Daniela, do I have still time? One, one minute. One minute, one yeah. minute. And uh, of course, um, the multidisciplinarity. That also becomes that also becomes a critical component. But here, in terms of multidisciplinarity, it reminds me the diversification strategy in terms of product and geographical diversification. Over to over diversify is quite dangerous because it can bring a disaster on the organizational setting. But you need to find to what extent you want to diversify. Because if you are bringing in the same paper four or seven different theories from different fields, I think that it becomes really hard to understand what is your contribution. Of course, one overarching theory is very good, but over diversifying here would be dangerous in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Zlomo. Thank you very much because, uh, for your tips. I complement the previous one because you focus on the content. So where is the contribution, the, co the conceptual contribution? So where is the knowledge gap you are feel, you are going to feel, how to feel, uh, how to feel this? And also the multidisciplinarity, which is a really oh, a, a great topic. How can we manage? So thank you very again. So now, Elisa, Elisa Giuliani, uh, thank you for your tips and especially for organizing this uh, exciting. So thank you, double thanks. Elisa Giuliani, Editor Research Post. Okay, so good morning. Um, I'm going to focus here on uh, gap and positioning of the paper. Um, as a general uh, tip, but also to overcome uh, 
the phase of desk rejection at research policy. So what makes you more likely that the paper go through to the reviewers? And I want to be very concrete. So I will uh, offer here an example that is not necessarily real, but is very realistic based on my uh, five-year experience with the journal now, first as associate editor and now as editor. So one of the typical pitfalls that I find in a lot of the submissions is that I get a paper on a really new topic or a really new uh, context of research, for instance, an industry or a country that has not been uh, investigated. And, and, and that is, is, is exciting, is new, but the theoretical setting, the research questions are very, very old. They are not original per se. Uh, they come from a very established tradition and they don't make any novel uh, contribution. So take, for instance, green innovation. We nowadays get a lot of papers on green innovation, which clearly, phenomenologically, is a very important topic, given the environmental and climate change concerns that we have. So we want to know more about green innovation. But then sometimes I get papers that explore, for instance, very old questions like, does interorganizational uh, collaboration foster uh, green innovation? So it's the same question, but in a different setting. The setting is interesting, but the question is the old one, okay? So in our field, interorganizational uh, impacts and interorganizational networking impacts on innovative output has been a sector. It's a topic that has uh, received a lot of interest, has attracted a lot of research, looking at the baseline, but also the moderating and mediating factor and contingency factors of that baseline relationship. So. Clearly, this is a very crowded space where it is very, very difficult to make a novel conceptual contribution. So, and especially when then eventually the paper corroborates earlier findings in another setting. So that's not the type of uh, uh, paper that goes through uh, very open or very easily the desk rejection phase. So my suggestion in these cases is basically to think about how the new context, be it like a new phenomenological context or an industry or an under-investigated country, uh, can potentially shed new light into this old established uh, relationship or old established research question. Is it shedding new light? Is it providing new insights that lead us to rethink entirely that particular relationship, to spark new thinking, to debunk old, uh, uh, theories and so on. So that's very important. And and so taking an old question into a context that is very interesting uh, and uh, corroborating earlier research is not the typical paper that really uh, goes through. And uh, the reviewers will have the same kind of uh, uh, concerns. So I don't, I, I try to spare their time and the time of the authors and I send it back to the authors. So this is, of course, an example, but it gives you an idea of the effort that you have to put to be creative in terms of the overall message and the overall story that you are uh, trying to deliver to the community. So a new topic per se is not something that gets published uh, uh, just because it's new. Finally, also, let me say something about positioning. Uh, because the research policy is now an A-star journal in the ABS classification, it matters for 10 years tenure track positions and tenures uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the business school. And uh, therefore, we get a lot of papers that are rejected from top five uh, management journals. We get a lot of paper uh, that I, I feel they are rejected from jibs from the way they are written. Of course, they come from these different journals. They're, you know, written very nicely. Uh, they are, you know, well, the analysis may even be very well executed. So they're almost perfect, formally very perfect uh, papers. But then really uh, they don't make any effort to engage in a useful conversation that matters in our community or that matters in for the journal that is connected to anything that the journal has been discussing. Be it, you know, uh, uh, even if it's a novel idea, it has to be some kind of introduction to, to this new community. So if, if I get a paper that it's clear that has been written for jibs and get to us just because there is the word innovation among the keywords, then okay, again, I have uh, problems. I will not possibly desk reject it because the paper can be very high quality, but then the reviewers uh, are going to question that as well. And then uh, it, you know, it starts a long process. So again, 
this is very easy to reposition a paper when you when you send the paper to a completely different audience uh, and that's that's for me a very important time saving uh, tip I'm thank, done. You, thank you Elisa for these tips uh, of course uh, you focus on how to engage the reader uh, and also how to fit with the scope of the journal which is very relevant because we cannot change journal uh, uh, but we need to check the scope of the journal and so to fit with the scope and on the other uh, time uh, on the same time we need to engage the reader so clarity uh, is very uh, is relevant is crucial in order to uh, convey the message in a in a good way so thank you again uh, now it's time to narula rajinish narula Journal of International Business Studies. So, Elisa mentioned it before. Right, thank you very much. Um, uh, and especially to the people who have come before me, uh, both uh, Elisa and Shlomo have made almost all my points. Uh, so, I, I will be able to keep it brief uh, as requested. I think the, I, I really want to emphasize Shlomo's point about the, that there has to be a conceptual idea uh, there. And uh, but it's not always necessary. I mean, there are papers which are have and make an important empirical point. Um, of course, ideally, uh, all papers should make uh, uh, both, uh, but we don't. That does not normally often happen. Nonetheless, it is really important that the two connect. The number of papers that I see which have a make a conceptual point. And then you go to the data and you find that there is actually not a connection between the two. Uh, and it's quite common. It's quite a common problem. Um, and sometimes people are also, uh, it's a separate but related point, uh, authors spend too much time showing off how much they know. Uh, it's not, you're not writing a handbook on the subject. You are writing a paper. Uh, 10,000 words is your, generally your limit. Don't try to write a handbook. We don't want to see how much you know, how many people you know, and all that type of thing. It should get to the point fairly quickly. Uh, the space is a premium from an editorial point of view. I don't want to see, if I see a paper more than 10,000 words, there has to be a really good reason for me to be going there, even 8,000 words. Um, so I, I think uh, the earlier point made, I think, uh, by Altman was about the about how you present the paper. Um, use the introduction uh, because abstract is by definition a limited uh, scope and I tend to not pay very much attention to what people say in the abstract because I think it goes to the, to the introduction and the introduction should tell the reader why they should read the paper and the editor is a reader. Uh, you need to connect it to the bigger picture. Uh, it's not about one obscure test that you have discovered that will reveal a new uh, uh, aspect to the data. You need to tell us why why I should spend two hours of my life reading your paper carefully and why I should not stop after the first paragraph. It's your job to do the selling. And a lot of people don't sell the paper. Don't waste your time with fancy titles. Right? People who think that uh, it's that entertaining titles will will get more citations. There's no correlation, uh, you know. Frankly, uh, a good uh, title should be informative, not entertaining. Entertainment. I have Netflix. So uh, you know. And then I think the last point I want to make is: don't use a hammer to crack a walnut. Uh, this is one my, my PhD supervisor made this point that uh, econometrics and statistics are only tools. You are illustrating a conceptual point. If you don't have to go over the top, there's no need to demonstrate to us that you took a lot of econometrics when you were doing your PhD. Uh, we're not giving you points for that. We are, we are it, Use the tools that are needed to make the point and don't get carried away with this. It's just painful to see 30 pages of tables as an, as an appendix and not knowing what to do with them because I really don't want to know. I want to get you to get to the point and do it in the simplest possible way that you are able to do. So I think I, I will, uh, the last, very last, if I have a minute, is to say there has to be a so what to the paper. It's not about doing a perfect paper, it's about 
saying so what what is the so what and i need to see the so what in the introduction i need to see the so what in the conclusion there's no so what you wasted my time and i really you know i mean i'm not not known for my patience but i don't think you know as, a, as an editor you see the times you have so many papers you are looking for a reason to to go back to doing something uh, more productive than to look for the reason why i'm reading the paper all right i stop there yeah thank you thank you rajinesh so uh, you you highlight how to sell the paper so no catchy title sometimes we we focus on catchy title but but be much more um how you say uh, informative as you say and also econometrics so you you said that econometric is a tool it's not the end so uh, again the the topic of rigor how to balance the re the rigor of the paper and the relevance for community for also for practitioners so it's very interesting so let me introduce now Ad uh, alberto alberto di minin associate editor r d management uh, buongiorno daniela hello everyone okay five minutes and the floor is yours yes uh, daniela um i I, I love the, the comments made so far and uh, um, the, the last comment. I cannot resist responding, responding Rajnes, uh comment about okay. fancy title because uh, um, I, um, I respectfully uh, disagree with, with, with Rajnes' point just because I have the feeling that my co-authors invite me on board as co-author only because I come up with the fancy title. I probably, Alfredo is here, so he in my comment on that, because I have the feeling that I'm only <laughs> in for the, for the fancy titles. That's so, not true. That. <laughs> Rajnesh, you, you are keeping away, you're, you're stealing away my, my, my core pieces here. So we love let me disagree so with that's, you. That's your with, role. Uh, Please, that. Albert. But, uh, but anyway, um, my main uh, advice uh, uh, is, uh, um, is to uh, join the debate, really. Uh, your paper, uh, whatever journal uh, you want to publish in, is not a message in a bottle sent uh, out there. It's about the starting point of a conversation. It's not a great way to establish a conversation uh, uh, with your prospective editor saying, no, dear editor, uh, I have been trying to publish this manuscript for a while. Uh, I tried different journals. Uh, they all have uh, impact factors way, way higher than your triple something. And I, I didn't make it. Um, I had five minutes of my time to write uh, down, uh, uh, go to Manuscript Central and upload the paper on your website. Uh, uh, here you go, ciao. No, I mean, uh, you are definitely, if you're trying to do this, uh, you are in for a, um, a desk reject, even with, uh, with R&D management. R&D management is a um, strange, uh, peculiar, very uh, particular journal. Uh, we have, uh, um, uh, we have uh, um, a, a specific uh, focus uh, that you need to keep in, in mind when you submit uh, to, uh, uh, to, to the journal. And uh, of course, uh, 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 let me make a simple example. Uh, before submitting a journal, uh, before submitting to any journal, check if there is a, a special issue on the topic you are uh, planning to write and if uh, if there is uh, and you're not sending uh, to the special issue but you're sending as a general submission that really tells me something about uh, the fact that you probably did not explore uh, the website of the journal uh, and um, julia is uh, sending out uh, the the link to the to the website of R&D management of the chapter uh, we have a, a community of practice uh, that is uh, uh, clustered around uh, R&D management, and that makes us a, a little bit uh, peculiar. The type of conversation you want to establish is uh, somehow uh, also embedded in a discussion with, uh, with practitioner in that uh, um, community. So if you already sh show the editor uh, empathy uh, with uh, that, uh, that community, um, is, uh, uh, it's a good starting point. If in, in my life, in my last uh, 30 seconds, uh, let me make this point. Um, for all of you seeking tenure, who already have tenure, please don't, don't forget that research 
leaves a paper trail, but the research is not about leaving a paper trail. So uh, it's really about joining a conversation, a debate. If you have the urge to publish, but you don't have a message, you are in for um, a, a very difficult, uh, difficult uh, journey. Okay, thank you, Alberto, for highlighting. The <laughs> so, uh, why I have to read the paper, engage the paper, engage the reader, engage the community, and, and deliver a, cl a clear, a clear message to to practitioners. Of course, a good theory make a good practice. So that uh, sometimes we forget about that, and we focus on only on uh, analysis or rigor because we. But, Again, I, I, I agree with your message. So now, uh, Cleopatra. Well. Hello, how are you? What a great honor to be here with you. Uh, I love Italians. Since it seems that this session is more focused on new career people, I am even more excited. Mind you, I started from a family that my father never finished, finished primary school and my mother never finished high school. Uh, I'm now a professor of brand management in one of a, a very good university, the University of Glasgow, top 15 uh, times higher education. I am publishing for the last 20 plus years. I won't tell you how many because you will judge my, you will understand age and they don't want that to be revealed. Um, and uh, I am the editor in chief, one of the two editors in chief of the Journal of Product and Brand Management for seven years now. Uh, for the last almost a year, I'm an associate editor of the Journal of Business Research. And my uh, mode is I am learning every day. So I'm here to share with you what I know so far about one specific stage that rather than finding a problem, you should celebrate. It's called revise and resubmit. Is the moment that you have gone through the desk reject. Wow, most journals have 50 to 60% desk reject rate. You have gone through the first round and two, three, four, depending on the journal, very established, very well-known people come to you and tell you, here is what needs to be done next. And you get these reports and you get shocked and you say, damn it, that shouldn't have happened. My papers would have gone through like that with no changes. The first thing that you need to, st to stop and reflect on is that we are all working with the same aim. And the aim is to produce the best, the best possible output that can be produced from this theoretical approach and this data set. We are all in the same game, editors, reviewers, and yourselves. And if you want my personal advice and your personal opinion, because I have just an opinion, nothing more than that, it's on your benefit as an author to have the best output, because you will carry it for the rest of your, of your life. As an editor, I will spend a few hours reading reviews and the paper. As a reviewer, I will spend a few hours reviewing a paper. And that is going to be all. It's not going to be against my name for the rest of my life. So you need to take these reviews and start thinking how I can make this particular piece superb, shining, flying. My advice to you is to read very carefully, first of all, the editor's letter. Very often, editors give additional advice or highlight what is important in their letters. Get a good note of that and start writing the points that the editor mentioned. And in addition to anything else, write a response to them. Then take the reviewer's points and Analyze them one by one by one. Remember, the editor is asking you to address them, to follow the advice, meaning that if you disagree and you have good arguments, 
and you come from the literature, with, with literature support, you say, listen, I don't agree with that. This shouldn't be happening. This is contradicting my hypothesis, my assumptions, my whatever, or whatever this work stands for, it's fine. You need to go to address every single point and explain what you did to make the paper better. So this response is explaining not how, like a slave, you obeyed to the master, which is the reviewer, but how you took this advice and intellectually and with a lot of thinking, you tried to produce the best possible output. That's the idea, that's all. And it's on the editor's hands to see what you have done and agree or don't agree. The decision is always with the editor, not with the reviewers. I have accepted papers, that two reviewers accepted and one rejected. I have rejected papers that there were two accepts and one major re uh, uh, revision because I didn't feel that there was enough contribution. So building on what all the previous people that are much wiser than me have said so far, think of what is unique, interesting, superb on your paper and try to improve it even more in the revision process by answering point after point and looking at the literature. Am I okay with my four minutes? Yeah, no, no, it's okay for now. So, uh, Cleopatra, thank you for uh, for shedding some light on RNR process. It's thank very you for tough. the honor of inviting me and for giving me no. the, the, you know, the panel. Yeah, there are some, some questions that are coming from the audience. So, uh, in the second round, we, we have time to discuss about, about this. So, now, Alfredo. Thank you. Yes, thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for involving me here. I think I've agreed to basically share my experience as editor of entrepreneurship here in practice, but also talking, you know, about my, exper my experience here as an editor of FBR, Family Business Review, on two points. One is uh, a point that has already been mentioned, which is balancing, you know, considering rigor also and the impact of our articles. And the second one is about uh, the, you know, how to get published with qualitative uh, papers, which we know is something that sometimes uh, is uh, quite challenging. So let me start for the first point. Well, I think that overall, you know, even the leading journals, and especially I would say the leading journals, are kind of making a shift from, uh, you know, many years where we have been uh, mainly been uh, uh, interested and sometimes even obsessed with rigor, you know, uh, trying to achieve the best possible, most perfect uh, uh, model uh, to, to predict a phenomenon or whatever, uh, which is, of course, very important, especially for the reading journal like, you know, ETPs or the many others that uh, have been represented uh, today here. Now we are also considering, and I think it will become more and more important also to look at impact. So why do papers that get published in leading journals, you know, besides being very well done, and we know that any study has, of course, characterized by, by uh, you know, limitations, but uh, why is it relevant? For whom? So my first advice here is that I see too much, you know, papers that take a kind of incremental path. What I mean is that people try to say, okay, let me study, you know, the impact of this variable on performance. What are the antecedents of this? How do this factor mediate or moderate that relationship? Right? Things like that. My first advice is when you think about submitting a paper to a leading journal, probably the starting aim should be to identify a really fundamental question. And still in entrepreneurship, in management, you know, in international business, in many fields, we still have so many unaddressed questions. So for example, you know, why do organizations exist? Uh, you know, this is an example of what I mean by fundamental question. Why do entrepreneurs start up a company? Uh, you know, how does the current pandemic and its consequence uh, challenge the assumption that we have in a given field. Um, how do organizations regenerate themselves over time? These are examples of, 
of uh, fundamental questions, very relevant and relevant for practice. And of course, you know, responding to this challenge means, uh, you know, uh, undertaking uh, or going to also some uh, data and uh, methods challenge, because probably to address this complex question, we will need uh, to also challenge ourselves methods wise, you know, by looking at, uh, uh, by exploring other units of analysis, by, you know, looking at the new methods. I'm thinking, for example, uh, about, you know, uh, methods like the experience sampling methods that allow you to collect many uh, different uh, information per day through the study of diaries of CEOs. But, you know, what, what I'm trying to say is that, of course, you know, means uh, exiting, uh, somehow leaving our comfort zone and challenging ourselves. It also means uh, uh, engaging with practitioners from the very beginning of your research. I could say, based on my own experience as an author, that most of the papers that are more cited uh, are those, uh, you know, where the research question really emerged by engaging with practitioners. So, for example, I work a lot with consultants, which I think uh, I find very useful, for example, for studying, you know, failures, for studying, uh, you know, uh, but there are also some methods that uh, lend themselves well for this. For example, think about action research and these kind of things. I know that my friend and colleagues, Alberto Di Minin, works a lot with practitioners also in his, uh, in his own research projects. Okay, Alfredo, sorry, I have to stop. Uh, I know that uh, Regini should have to, uh, to go away. So uh, I want to thank you for, for joining us and for contributing. And then we, we want to open up the floor. We have a lot of questions from the YouTube. So I love to create some sort of interaction. This is uh, the added value of this panel. So thank you, Alfredo. Thank you, Rajneesh. And uh, so let's get started with the first uh, uh, question. So there is a question from Alessandra Mazzei, and uh, maybe we can, we can, uh, and so, uh, okay, Alessandra Mazzei, so some speakers underline the, contrib the, uh, the contribution to the theoretical advance. So she, she's question, what about the relevance for management practice? So Alfredo and also uh, Alberto uh, gave him some comments about that, but how much is taken to account to the other to the other journal? Because I know that R and D management and maybe um, entrepreneurship theory and practice uh, give more uh, value to the practitioner. So the question is, how can do that in other in other journal? For example, Cleopatra uh, and Elisa. So just a few is Lomo. Yokohan. I heard my name. Okay. Hello, hello. hello. Uh, I think that the question is self exploratory, self answered. Meaning what? What, are, what is management? Management is knowledge from practice that is then um, organized in theories and in things that work for practice. We are not philosophy. We need to have practical applications. So if what we do is totally theoretical with no practical uh, implications, uh, this questions the necessity of what we are doing. We are training people to go and work in business. We are not training them just to be philosophers. Yes, having some sort of theoretical approach is very important, especially for organizing our thinking processes. But if we don't at the same time produce some managerial implications, why do we really need to engage in research in our field? Thank so you. that's my answer. Thank you. Slomo, can you, can you add something? Uh, I would like to refer to a different aspect here, okay. uh, please. I think it's really important to distinguish between the so-called classic scholarly journals and the executive-oriented journals, because uh, the target population is different. And at the time, I realized that even the language used for those journals is absolutely different. Uh, in the past, I have served as a guest editor 
on the topic of strategic agility in California management review. I know that Alberto also has done several special issues, including the latest excellent special issue on the digitization, but obviously we are reading the papers and learning from them. Yes, but the language, the positioning is absolutely different from the classic scholarly journals because it's a different orientation. And I think this needs to be taken into account. Frankly, in the past, I have many friends from uh, high tech industry. Originally, I'm coming from biotechnological industry, by the way. I'm a virologist originally by my education, yeah, before diversifying into business strategy and so on. So many of my friends, they said, we are not reading the papers published in Strategy Journal and we don't have any intention so far. But on the other hand, I have many friends that actually are reading and trying to learn, especially how to deal, how to become resilient given the COVID crisis. And this connects very well to the topic of our session, how to tackle grand challenges. I think this is very important. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Zlomo. So again, is this cough the journal? Be careful. May, be... may I ask? Yeah, the language is different. The language and the, and the um, percentage is different, but we always have to think when we do research, what are the managerial implications? It's like teaching an undergraduate student and a PhD student the same topic, or a primary school uh, student and a university student mathematics. We always have to think that this thing exists. The emphasis we are going to give might be different. The language we are going to give might be different, but we always need to think, so what for practice? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, Cleopatra, is a good point. So the language, because sometimes we need to create some cross-domain teams, but the problem is the language is try to create some linkages and to convey, to, to broker some message. So. So that's a good point. So we have other questions from, from the floor, from our YouTuber. So maybe we can, we can, yes. There is Maria Rosa Di Giacomo. Good morning. I would like to ask to Professor Lisa Giuliani if there is a journal interest for paper based on natural language process approach. So uh, different methods, different analysis. There is really well, I would say that I, yeah, I would say that in principle, I don't see any reason why not. Uh, of course, uh, it largely depends on the research questions that you have or how you frame the paper. Um, uh, if it's a just a purely methodological paper, uh, then we also have the option of uh, publishing uh, um, research notes that are smaller. Uh, articles that have make a very precise uh, methodological point, sometimes replicate existing empirical uh, studies uh, to point out some methodological issues or problems or caveats and so on. So we do have this double uh, possibility of using that methodology for, for a paper where, you know, it's, you make a bigger point or you contribute to the literature and we don't see, I don't see why we should exclude this particular approach. Uh, I think it's very interesting. We are very open to, uh, we're very interdisciplinary journal as well. So we are very open to a multiple uh, methodological approaches. We are not very dogmatic, uh, in fact. And, uh, but if it's just a methodological piece, then I would consider or think about considering uh, research policy, research notes. I mean, the, the shorter papers, okay. shorter papers. So I have another question for all the panelists. Um, actually, this point has been raised from Cleopatra. So the r, &R uh, process, which is very tough sometimes. And sometimes there are two or three reviewers that make different and contrasting points. So from the perspective of the authors or the junior colleagues, how can I manage? How can I do that? Because sometimes if, if, if I want to be better, but sometimes I don't want to disappoint the reviewer. I can do that. Cleopatra? I That's can start. Mm -hmm. The paper is your baby. Mm -hmm. 
you are going to send the kindergarten to school, whatever, but it's going still to be your baby. So if you don't agree with the viewers, you need to take the risk and say, listen, this is what I think that I contribute. This is what I want to be known for. I, I don't feel that what the reviewer says makes sense, but put it in nice language because of such and such and such contradicts that and that, and stick to your guns. I've done it very many times. Some of my papers that are published in good journals went through like that. The important thing is to remember that all the reviewers, the editor, and yourself are aiming for the best output. And the reviewers are there to give you their advice as consultants. Okay. If you disagree, you need to have very solid evidence. Do not disagree with something very minor, add the paragraph, add two sentences. Chances are that you don't see their point if it is something that minor. If it's something major, you have very solid view. You might be the expert and they might need this and know this area into the periphery. You need to build arguments in your answer, not necessarily in the paper. Uh, many times, the answer to the reviewers ends up to be longer than the actual paper. Thank you, Clopato. There is another question that uh, shed light on conceptual uh, framework. So there is another, maybe you can, we, we can, yes. Uh, about the theoretical contribution, again, is very different theory, a different way to look into the research question how to choose the best theory and how many theory can be incorporated. Again, is it the, how can we manage the multidisciplinarity? Sometimes there is some mismatch, yeah, also philosophical mismatch between the theory and the tool that we are going. Please, Alfredo, go. Okay, and then yeah, you I mean, thank yeah. you. This is, uh, this is an important question. What I would say is that the ideal situation is probably when you are able to find out somehow an overarching theory, an overarching framework where you can place all the arguments that together, you know, convey your story. However, this is not always possible. What is important in my view is that you try to be as uh, much parsimonious as possible in uh, picking up the theories. And sometimes you can also, depending on the nature of your study, craft a study where, for example, you pick up two theories and you try to integrate them and or to situate them, probably showing the limits and the boundary conditions and how, or showing also how they complement each other. So overall, you know, I would say that uh, adding too many theories is per se not so good, just because, uh, uh, you know, a, a, good, uh, uh, a good theory uh, should, be, should be supported by a unifying overarching framework. Uh, just try to be uh, as much parsimonious as possible. Yukohan, I would like to yeah to hear your your point. You talking to me? Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, I would recommend don't play with more than two theories at the same time in one paper. Remember, you only have eight thousand to ten thousand words typically. So you know, if you think about it, you need to. The topic, then you need to explain what you want to do. Then you have to do the methodology and the findings. I mean, you don't have the scope. It also depends what is exactly that you're trying to achieve. So sometimes if you want to contrast theories through your data, then obviously then that is the focus. Sometimes you want to uh, propose an alternative approach, an alternative theory to the uh, one, the consensual one existence. But overall, I, uh, it was said before, uh, you know, in this panel, don't play with too many theories. Uh, it simply doesn't work for a paper. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, more, <laughs> less is more, is a, is a, a sort of comment. Less is more, and uh, we try to do that. Okay, mm, we, we, the time is over. We are going to open for the open session. So I would like to thank you for uh, the interaction, for your panelists, 
and because I, I hope that we can come away with something new that can get our uh, publication and our publish the journey, the long journey of publishing um, smooth and productive as well. So thank you for the panelists. Thank you for joining us, for your comments. It's very insightful for, for sharing your, your tips and your passing knowledge. Thank you for the audience, for the YouTuber, LinkedIn, Facebook, and also thank you, a very a warm thank you to the organizer, the local organizer, a special thank you to Elisa, to Daniele, and all the technical staff that are over behind in the so thank you again and uh, see we thank you thank and we thank Sima and the audience, all of us. You okay. have been wonderful. Thank you for the invitation and for being so open. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Next Ciao. Year. Everybody. Ciao. 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 Bye bye. Ciao.
Bye. Buongiorno a tutti, good morning to everyone, and welcome to this uh, 2020 uh, Synergia SIMA conference. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Università di Pisa and uh, Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna for hosting the conference, uh, and Director uh, uh, Mancarella and Director Nuti uh, for uh, uh, hosting us uh, and for the welcome. Um, I want to thank also uh, all uh, the colleagues and the staff of Synergie, Fondazione Quaim and SIMA, uh, they were able, uh, together with uh, the local organizer, the chairs, uh, to do a Mission Impossible, to change the format of this conference in a few weeks from a face-to-face -face conference to a um, uh, hybrid or a digital conference. And uh, the results are impressive. We received 150 papers, uh, from 350 uh, authors from uh, 80 different universities. So I really thank for these uh, results all the staff of the University of Pisa and Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna and all the colleagues and the organizers. Uh, I want to thank also all the authors because they were uh, able to write their extended abstract, their papers, the cases during the lockdown period. The first deadline of this conference was March, and we postponed the uh, conference deadline in May, exactly the lockdown period. This is for us an incredible signal of uh, closeness and also attention to our conference and our uh, association. Obviously, thank you to all the speakers we have seen the previous interesting uh, uh, session, but we have other plenary session. Thank you to all the chairs and to uh, the moderators and sponsors, because uh, 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 was, we were able to do this conference. Thank you. Thanks also to the support and the economical support of our uh, our sponsor. Uh, as SIMA, during uh, as, uh, Italian Society of Management, during this lockdown period, uh, we did, we focused on some uh, activities, we were, we were very active, and we will see the result of the this first year of mandate uh, of the new board uh, during uh, uh, the assembly, the, we have the general assembly this afternoon at uh, uh, 5.45 uh, p.m. Please join us during the assembly, you will see all the details about uh, the activities and the future project, but I want to recall just a few things. First of all, uh, we wrote uh, a, a 2022 strategic plan, defining the goals for the next years. Uh, we did activities uh, for defining the organization with the local representatives, uh, and uh, we did many activities also on the communication, website, newsletter, and management notes, blog uh, sites. Uh, last but not least, we worked uh, uh, and we focused a lot with uh, an international group on the internationalization side. Uh, we, uh, uh, we, we, we strengthened our relationship with our, we can say, international sister uh, association, uh, EUROMED, uh, EURAM, British Academy of Management, and EGOS. And the presidents and the board members of this uh, uh, association, they will give uh, a first uh, a small speech uh, later. I want to thank also uh, the uh, national sister, uh, we can say, association that uh, is first of all IDEA uh, with President Gaetano Aiello, um, Riccardo Riciniti from, Strat uh, from Società Italiana Marketing, and uh, uh, Fondazione Quaim, that is our partner with the President uh, Federico Testa, is our partner for Synergy uh, for organizing this uh, conference. Uh, my wish. Uh, is uh, that this conference will be fruitful for all of you, for your research, and uh, uh, you will have many insights uh, to create, you know, considering uh, the title of this conference, uh, to, to face this grand, this grand challenge, you know, how to create a better future, how to create a better society. And in this moment, we really need it. Thank you to all of us, and I ask the technical staff to launch the first video from uh, our international partner. Oh, sorry.
sorry, we have first of all, uh, Professor uh, Mancarella, uh, Director of uh, Pisa uh, University, and then Professor uh, Nuti, uh, Rector of uh, Superi uh, in Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. Sorry for this. Well, it should be, the, should be the other way around, ladies first. But anyway, <laughs> good morning and uh, welcome to the 2020 edition of this uh, Synergy SIMA conference, whose organization has involved uh, with great honor, I would say, and pleasure our university, and in particular the Department of Economics and Management, aiming at a very high profile program on. Uh, as the relationship between uh, business and human rights. Leave no one behind. These words represent nowadays more than ever the cornerstones on which we should build our future. As you will surely remember, five years ago, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, opened with this sentence our huge collective journey the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. A journey, unfortunately, still uh, uncertain and still leaving a great gap between words and actions so far. Nevertheless, today we are dramatically called to order by the economic crisis the pandemic generated. We can no longer afford to avert our eyes from what should be our common goal the implementation of a right, fair and sustainable development model, enhancing stakeholders, especially the most fragile, as much as the shareholders. It is necessary to understand and let the new generations understand that doing business should not only aim at turning a profit, but also at actually fostering an improvement of the world conditions. It is uh, furthermore crystal clear to me that the political action of our governments is no longer adequate, and therefore we are called to actions. This is one more reason why I proudly say that the University of Pisa, which is one of the most ancient and prestigious European higher education institutions, boasts such a long tradition of studies in this field, including the same uh, in its statutes, and more recently in its uh, strategic plan, turning the culture of sustainable development into a crucial issue of its activity in social, economic, and environmental contexts. And this culture has taken shape in the activity of the University of Pisa since uh, uh, 2017 through the Responsible Management Research Center, so-called REMARC, undertaking frontier research on responsible management and sustainable development, and constantly raising awareness among our researchers about the RRI, the Responsible Research and Innovation, to enhance understanding the effects and the possible impacts of their activities on environment and society. Today, moreover, we have three interdepartmental centers which clearly aim at achieving the sustainable development goals stated by the United Nations Organization, the Research Center for Nutraceuticals and Food for Health, for Health, the Research Center Energy and Sustainable De Development, and finally the Research Center Studies on Climate Change Impacts. So we think that setting up this conference actively contributes to the creation of the future society. And this is why before giving the floor to Sabine and to our panelists, I wish to thank Synergy and SEMA for giving, uh, for giving us the opportunity to contribute to the conference organization. And my special thanks to Professor Elisa Giuliani, the director of the Responsible Management Research Center, and uh, all the members of the conference organizing committee uh, who have made a great job, as previously said. So thank you for your attention, your kind attention, and uh, good luck with, uh, with your work. Thank you.
Sabina, please, it's uh, your turn. The floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, I'm really happy to be here today to welcome all you to this uh, conference. Um, I, it's, it's for me a great honor, but I would say it's especially a big pleasure. Why? Because I am rector of Scuola Sant'Anna, but I'm also a professor of management. So I would say that I am quite excited this morning for opening up this, uh, uh, this very important conference. Uh, what is the message I would like to leave to all the participants? Well, I think uh, that uh, this uh, historic moment is really particular for, for researchers that work on management. Well, why? I was just reading uh, in this weekend uh, the, the draft uh, version of the strategic plan for Horizon Europe uh, for 2021, 2000, for the next years. And uh, what really uh, comes out from the new proposal is uh, that we have to uh, be able to put together what we always worked on, like innovation, like ecosystem, like uh, uh, new technologies, but we have to link them with what we call the European values. So we need to have our society able to uh, uh, work for uh, civil rights, uh, able to be inclusive and to be more resilient. And I think this is a really incredible challenge for people like us that wants to study and to research on management topics. Uh, especially, I, I work in healthcare and in these last months so with the uh, COVID pandemia, we all, I think we all realized like uh, how important are organizational and management issue if you want really uh, to, to be able to resist a situation like the one we, are, we went through and we are still going through. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of uh, researchers uh, from other sectors uh, thought that we could, uh, um, uh, we could predict with a very um, uh, sophisticated uh, mathematical uh, uh, models uh, what is will what could be you now the future of the pandemia and the numbers. And then we realized that this wasn't really the case, that each uh, uh, country, each region, uh, uh, each town uh, could have different uh, type of situation. And a lot uh, uh, was linked to the type of organization issue, how the healthcare system was organized. So. Why I think this is important? Because I think this is our time. This is the moment where management professor have to really make the difference and uh, get their uh, contribution, put their contribution on, on the table to uh, help uh, our society, our countries uh, to improve. Um, I think that, uh, um, I, 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 I think to our institution, Scuola Sant'Anna, we have uh, six uh, research institutes. One of the, the is management institute and is divided in three areas, uh, healthcare, sustainability and innovation. Well, these three areas together uh, really should work uh, to, 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 to make the management uh, uh, field and uh, approach uh, really uh, inside uh, all the programs and the projects that we want to carry out, uh, for example, with the recovery plan. So I think this uh, conference, uh, it comes in the right moment. Um, I know there are really a lot of uh, papers uh, and contribution also on the COVID pandemia. So I really think uh, that the work that and the discussion uh, that uh, will be done in, in this uh, conference uh, can be uh, valuable for all, uh, for our country and for all Europe. So welcome uh, to this conference uh, and I will try to follow most of the, the conference because I'm really interested in what is going to be uh, the discussion that uh, will be held uh, during these uh, days. So welcome.
Rector uh, Mancarella and Rector Nuti for uh, hosting the conference and for the, the insightful words. Uh, now we have uh, uh, the um, uh, greetings from uh, our uh, international partners. We will start with the uh, British Academy of Management President, uh, Nick Beach, uh, then uh, with uh, Euram. Uh, uh, President uh, Catherine uh, Meslow and uh, uh, the member of the board of EGOS, uh, uh, our colleague Luigi Mangia. We will close this video with uh, uh, the uh, greetings from uh, IDEA and uh, the President uh, Gaetano uh, Aiello. I ask the technical uh, support, the technical staff to launch uh, the first video from uh, British Academy of Management. Hello, my name is Nick Beach and I'm President of the British Academy of Management. Thank you both for your invitation to this conference and for this wonderful opportunity to become a partner. In particular, I would like to thank Professor Sandro Castaldo, President of CIMA, and Professor Arabella Mocchiaro Lidestri, who has been very generous with her time and worked so effectively in establishing our collaboration. I will briefly introduce BAM and say a word about our partnership. BAM was founded in 1986 and now has over 2,000 members. We started in the UK, but it is our desire to work with colleagues around the world to expand the knowledge and understanding of management and to support academics in our field. We operate in four main sections, management knowledge and education, capacity building for members, special interest groups and research. Through our partnership, we look forward to working together and welcoming SEMA members into these areas of activity and to joining you in your projects. We have 22 special interest groups and run around 50 workshops and symposia on special subjects each year. This is in addition to our main conference with around a thousand participants and our doctoral conferences. We have a framework and training events to support academic careers. And we have two highly ranked journals in the field. In addition, we are in the process of adding a third journal and we seek to support members and partners in publication activities. We also collaborate in providing grants for research and we're particularly keen to foster international studies that can influence both theory and practice. You will have realised partnership is a watchword for us and along with CIMA, we are working with ANZAM and IAM and believe there are many opportunities for us to work together to build a voice for management academia and to support the research, teaching and policy engagement of our societies. We are truly delighted to have this new membership scheme with SEMA and the joint grant and I want to end by saying a heartfelt thanks on behalf of all of the BAM membership. We look forward to getting to know you well and to a productive, enjoyable relationship. Dear colleagues, dear delegates, it's my great pleasure to be with you today at the occasion of the opening of the Synergy SEMA Annual Conference. I would like to cordially thank Professor Sandro Castaldo, President of SEMA, for offering the opportunity to address the delegates. This year is challenging for all of us. We had to redesign and reinvent our conferences to meet, exchange, and network in the cloud. Yet I'm really glad to join from a distance. My name is Katrin Mosley, president of EURAM, the European Academy of Management. Over the 20 years of existence of the European Academy of Management, Italian scholars have always been an important and inspiring part of our membership. About 10% of all EURAM members are based in Italy. This shows how close our organizations, ideas and goals are and how important the ongoing exchange is. We have always had informal ties with Italian learned societies. But since October 2019, the presidents of SEMA and EURAM have signed a dual membership agreement, giving SEMA members the possibility to become members of both organizations at once to enjoy the benefits of each society. This offer is especially attractive for PhD students. 
And if you wish to find more information, you will find a dedicated space on both our websites. But now let's focus on the theme of this conference, grand challenges, companies and universities working for a better society. This theme is especially close to my heart and to my personal research interest. Thus, I'm really looking forward to all future exchanges and bridges we might build. And I hope you will equally enjoy the scientific journey of the next two days. While we are enjoying this conference, I already hope to see many of you at our next URAM conference, which will take place in December. On 4th to 6th December, virtually in Dublin. Thus, once this conference is over, get your Guinness ready, just imagine the nice and rainy Irish weather and feel free to be part of Euram's virtual adventure. But for now, enjoy Italian sunshine, wonderful conversations, great presentations, have a wonderful exchange, all the best. Let's enjoy the conference. Thank you, Sandro, and thank you for your kind invitation. Really very, very much uh, appreciated. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, virtually, uh, and it's also a oh, big honor for me to uh, bring to you and to your association, to Società Italiana di Management, the official regards and greetings on behalf of my chair, Bernard Forg, and on behalf of the entire uh, EGOS Executive Board that I've been joining for uh, four years. I was elected the first time in 2016, in, uh, in December. Uh, we ran for the first time in Italy the colloquium in Naples, and during the following uh, election in December I was, I was elected. And now I am serving as the treasurer of in, uh, in, uh, in the EGOS Executive Board. Uh, just a couple of words on, on uh, my on the association that I am representing, and it's really a big honor for me. Uh, EGOS is, as you know, the European Group for Organizational Study. We have uh, uh, now approximately 2,600 uh, members from 70 different countries, approximately, and we are very, very proud of that. Uh, we are running two different journals. We launched a new journal one year ago, Organization Theory, and we are very, very proud of that. Uh, we like um, all kinds of diversity, and we try to keep in our colloquia uh, every year a pluralistic approach to understanding organizations. And in this light, uh, thank you again for uh, your kind invitation. I am sure that we will have uh, interesting opportunities to cooperate now and in the next future. And I'm also sure that we will be able to exploit all these interesting opportunities that we will have. Uh, so, um, uh, I really, I'm very much looking forward to seeing you in person, Sandro, and you all. Uh, thank you for your invitation to join your workshop in Palermo, and I can do the same, uh, inviting you and all your members to join the next EGOS Colloquium that will take place in Amsterdam in July 2021. We are working very hard to be, to be ready. Of course, uh, we, will, we do hope to be able to do everything in person, but it's not possible to say anything about that now, and we will see. So thank you again, really, for your uh, kind invitation. Very, very much uh, appreciated, and uh, enjoy this really amazing uh, workshop. Thank you so much. Cari colleghe e cari colleghi, un caro saluto da parte mia ed un grazie sincero per l'invito uh, al nostro presidente Sima, Sandro Castaldo, e ai co-chair del convegno Elisa Giuliani, Marco Frei e Marta Gulini. Un grazie che estendo a tutti coloro i quali hanno lavorato per l'organizzazione di un convegno 
sicuramente interessante, di elevata qualità scientifica, anche in tempi difficili, per i motivi a tutti voi noti. Mi spiace non potervi incontrare di persona e spero che questo potrà accadere molto presto. Da Presidente dell'Accademia Italiana di Economia Aziendale, oramai in scadenza di mandato, non posso che essere orgoglioso dei passi avanti che tutta la nostra comunità di aziendalisti ha compiuto in questi ultimi anni. Passi avanti che sono frutto di sforzi compiuti da molti ed in questa sede devo sottolineare, voglio sottolineare il contributo costante di Sima, di tutti i consiglieri che si sono succeduti nel Consiglio Direttivo e dei presidenti, prima Alberto Pastore e oggi Sandro Castaldo. Tra i risultati ottenuti, eh, il mio, secondo me quello più importante è l'ottenimento di questo sub-GEV di Area 13B, uno specifico gruppo di esperti di valutazione dedicato alla valutazione della qualità della ricerca scientifica o VQR, specifico per la nostra comunità di aziendalisti. Un altro risultato è quello che riguarda la procedura di abilitazione scientifica nazionale o ASN, grazie al lavoro della IDEA e di tutte le società aggregate, il nuovo regolamento per la gestione delle liste consentirà a breve alle società scientifiche di procedere alla segnalazione delle riviste straniere e noi abbiamo già pronto un primo elenco di 71 riviste, condiviso da tutti, lo abbiamo pronto come idea, lo sottoporremo all'attenzione dell'Ambur, la prima finestra utile che si sta aprendo in questi giorni. Aidea, infine, ha completato il processo di ranking delle riviste che sono l'espressione diretta dell'aziendalismo italiano. In questa sede, da Presidente Aidea, ma anche da collega di Economia e Gestione delle Imprese, devo sottolineare la performance ottima di Sinergie, l'Italian Journal of Management e dell'Italian Journal of Marketing, quella che era Mercati e Competitività. Anche qui, grazie al lavoro e allo spirito di servizio di molti colleghi, tutto l'aziendalismo, ma in particolare il settore Sexpi 08, il nostro settore, è davvero cresciuto molto in questi anni e sono sicuro che i più giovani sapranno consolidare il percorso di crescita con i loro contributi di ricerca. Però mi auguro anche che sapranno anche sacrificare una parte del loro tempo nei compiti di servizio alla nostra comunità che certamente lo merita. E dunque per concludere un caro saluto e un augurio eh, sincero a tutti per i lavori di questa Sinergia SIMA 2020 Conference e a presto. Now I leave the floor to Professor Riccardo Riciniti, President of uh, SIM. Ecco, grazie, grazie Sandro per l'invito, grazie anche ai colleghi che hanno organizzato questo importante convegno e, e io sono onorato come Presidente della Società della Marketing di portare gli auspici per questa conferenza di sinergie SIMA 2020. E il, primo, il primo auspicio è proprio quello che, che questa conferenza risponda al, al suo bellissimo titolo, che mette in evidenza l'importanza della collaborazione tra università e imprese per migliorare la società. E il tema, tra l'altro, questo della collaborazione è sempre stato un tema caro a Sinergia. Io credo di ricordare già un convegno a Verona alla fine degli anni 90, nel 98 se non sbaglio. E, ehm, questa, questa collaborazione, a mio avviso, è determinante per generare quell'innovazione necessaria, quell'innovazione di mercato, di prodotto e di processo necessaria a riposizionare l'industria nel suo senso più ampio verso le nuove esigenze e la domanda che si sono affermate in questo difficilissimo periodo. Eh, ci saranno trasformazioni nei settori molto forti, rilevanti, probabilmente nuovi settori nasceranno. E, ed è ormai evidente che per fare business occorre è importante un forte orientamento all'orientamento sociale, ai suoi nuovi bisogni, diciamo nuovi antichi e, e fondamentali bisogni, quello della, della salute, della sicurezza, l'abitazione, la solidarietà. In questo senso credo che la società non sia soltanto la beneficiaria di questa collaborazione tra imprese e università, ma ne sia proprio l'ispiratrice. Ed è altrettanto evidente che il marketing è essenziale per le imprese per trovare questa migliore sintonia con la domanda, in un nuovo approccio che deve 
essere soddisfacente, e questo ormai è evidente, tanto per gli individui, tanto per la collettività. E da questo tema del, ruolo, del nuovo ruolo del marketing che si va a inserire in questo contesto che sarà oggetto del convegno di quest'anno, della di, eh, sinergia SIMA, e a questo tema è dedicato anche il prossimo, la prossima conferenza SIMA che avrà luogo il, 28, il 29 e 30 ottobre a, alla LIUC e verrà poi naturalmente come avviene oggi un po' per tutte queste conferenze realizzata in modalità online e io sarei molto, cont molto contento, molto onorato che tutti potessero partecipare anche a questo altro evento che si annuncia eh, molto molto interessante. Per cui con questo invito e con un uh, ulteriore ringraziamento agli organizzatori saluto tutti e auguro buoni lavori. Vado. Buongiorno a tutti, eh, mi fa molto piacere essere qui oggi a condividere l'apertura di questo nostro convegno eh, io credo che quello di oggi sia un risultato importante per quello che stiamo vedendo e per quello che è il programma che abbiamo in questi eh, prossimi giorni Credo che questo sia stato possibile per gli sforzi di Sima, dello staff di Sinergie e, quando, e penso sia agli, agli editor ma anche a, a chi ha fatto il review eh, anonimo di, di quello che è arrivato. Credo che sia un risultato importante. E io non... Poi naturalmente c'è il contributo della, dei, dei colleghi di Pisa eh, che ci stanno ospitando e che stanno dando il massimo per rendere possibile eh, l'utilizzo di queste modalità di, nuove. Primo tra tutti il professor Dalli che è là in fondo che mi, mi fa segnali <ride> tutte le volte che devo dire qualcosa o che non devo dire e se la faccio troppo lunga non la farò troppo lunga io vorrei aggiungere solo una cosa eh, di cui mi scuso in anticipo ma a beneficio dei, dei più giovani guardate che dieci anni fa non avremmo fatto un convegno così non avremmo fatto un convegno di sinergie probabilmente a Pisa, non avremmo in programma di farlo fra due anni in Bocconi e non saremmo riusciti a portare a casa il risultato che è stato conseguito in questi anni ed è stato conseguito, guardate, me ne dimentico di sicuro, da, grazie all'impegno di Alberto, di, di Sandro, di Tonino, di Marco, della Marta, perché viene, noi che abbiamo qualche anno in più veniamo da un mondo diverso che eh, volendo, defini, che, volendo definirlo in maniera nobile era il mondo delle scuole diverse, ma dietro alle scuole c'erano anche eh, le cose più, altre cose più eh, se volete così, non banali, ma insomma anche altre cose. E quindi abbiamo avuto tutti dei grandissimi maestri che però non sempre avevano la capacità di, di fare squadra. tentativo che è stato fatto in questi anni è stato quello di superare quella storia, poi le scuole, le... le teoriche restano, le idee diverse tra di noi possono restare, ma di provare a mettere a fattor comune le cose che potevano essere messe a fattor comune e eh, provare a crescere tutti insieme. Questo convegno che stamattina Marta mi diceva a 280 partecipanti, in un momento come questo, fatto in queste modalità, è... Eh, è il segnale che eh, 
siamo sulla, sulla strada buona. Eh, dopodiché eh, la rivista sta crescendo, è diventata eh, online, eh, open access, eh, eh, faremo altre cose più, più che le cose che ci, ci restano da fare, ma credo che sia un risultato di cui va dato merito a tutti quelli che hanno contribuito perché non era scontato bene, l'ho fatta anche troppo lunga quindi buon lavoro a tutti eh, buon, eh, con un ringraziamento ancora a chi sta rendendo possibile tutto questo e io devo passare mi è stato ordinato dal professor Daldi la parola alla professoressa Elisa Giuliani che adesso ci spiega come lavoreremo i prossimi giorni. Grazie a tutti. Grazie. 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 So welcome everybody, my name is Elisa Giuliani, I'm a professor of management at Economia e Gestione delle Imprese here in Pisa and together with Marco, Marta and Sandro I chair this year's Synergy SEMA conference. I'm honored of this invitation and pleased to introduce you to the core themes of this conference which is on grand challenges and how the business sector and the academia can work to address pressing societal and environmental problems. Last year's conference in Rome was also on sustainability and how to create shared value in the digital area. But this one on sustainability is an ongoing conversation which deserves more consideration. Uh, since last year, it also became clear that we all need to address and, uh, sustainability challenges and we all urgently need to act. Demands on tackling climate change um, have become more pressing, also thanks to the visibility received by the Greta Thunberg movements, among others, and the current COVID-19 pandemics has exacerbated social tensions and made it uh, crystal clear that we need to act against economic and social inequalities. Of course, the business sector and the academia are both crucial to fix problems, uh, or prevent future sustainability catastrophes. And I think it has become now impellent to train future managers and entrepreneurs about these pressing sustainability challenges and also to rethink capitalism, giving it a second, perhaps last chance. Uh, I think we have an exciting program at this conference uh, to address these issues, uh, both in the parallel sessions and of course in the plenary sessions which involve both practitioners and academics who have taken this challenge very seriously and I hope will spark new thinking, new ideas about how to address these problems, um, which of course is important for both teaching and for inspiring new research and to know more about these things. Last but not least, uh, we have another responsibility, which is to make sure that on not only education, but also research uh, scientific research is moving in the right direction. We have experienced uh, enormous transformations in the past few years uh, about the expectations of scientific research in our field, also in other fields, and that has come with the greater demand of internationalization of our research output. However, greater internationalization makes sense only if it comes with greater quality, not uh, lower quality. So I think in this context, the panel on predatory publishing is both very relevant and timely, and I hope all of you will be able to attend. Without further ado, I will now leave the floor to Arabella, who will introduce our distinguished speakers for today. Thank you. 
Good morning. Uh, let me give you a very warm welcome to the first keynote speaker session of this uh, Synergia Sime Management Conference in Pisa and virtual 2020. I'm Arabella Mocciolo from the University of Palermo, and I have the pleasure of playing the role of a chair in this session with two exceptional keynote speakers. Let me introduce you the keynote speakers, first of all, and a little bit of rules of the game, and then we will proceed. Our first keynote speaker is Mette Morsin. She is Head of Principles of Responsible Management Education at the UN Global Compact Center in New York. Before that, she has played, uh, she's been Minstra Chair of Sustainable Markets and Executive Director of the Minstra Center for Sustainable Markets at the Stockholm School of Economics in Sweden. Also, she's been Professor of, Se uh, of Corporate Social Responsibility at the Copenhagen Business School. And in the same school, she founded the CBS Center for CSR. She will be presenting a paper today on the dynamics of voice and silence in organizations and the role of this in, uh, in global challenges. Our second keynote speaker today is Professor Philip Shapira. Philip Shapira is Professor of Innovation Management and Policy and also Director of the Management Ma Ma Manchester Institute of Innovation Research at the Alliance Manchester Business School in Manchester. He's also a part-time professor of public policy at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta in the United States. His research and engagement is internationally known in the field of science management, innovation management, and also responsible innovation. He will be talking to us and sharing his idea on research, redesigning research universities to better address social needs, inclusiveness, and sustainability. Each speaker will have 25 minutes to speak. I will warn you when we're five minutes before the end. But who's following us can actually formulate a question on the social YouTube, Facebook, or LinkedIn through the comments. And we will try to direct at least one or a couple of questions if we have time to our speakers. So without taking more time away from our keynotes, let me invite Mette to uh, take the word, please. Thank you very much, Arabella. I will just start by sharing my screen. Um, okay. Arabella, I'd like to show my slides. Uh, if you could give me a hint. Yeah, you could, uh, place your thing on the screen, screen share. Yes. You I've should have a mirror image. Go on to the center of the mirror, mirror image with your mouse. Mm, the yes. Yeah, and then a, a, a connect or share should be a blue button should arise on the, on the lower right hand. Condividi or share. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, um, a little button that t should turn blue. I don't see the blue thing. I can see the share screen, uh, and then I do not see uh, if I press Once that. Once you share screen, you should see your own screen with like a mirror image. It goes in. It goes into various squares until if you press in the center of your own screen, a little blue button that's white should turn blue that says "condividi." Green, you mean the green screen or? Your own screen, if you press the center of it. Yes, then I've got settings. Oh, settings. Now, if you in the middle, you should have, if you press it in the middle, then a button that says con, con, condividi in the bottom should turn from white to blue. No, it doesn't. I'm sorry about that. I sent my slides to Elisa. Maybe she could share them. Yeah, maybe. Yes. If you try, okay, if you press share screen. Yeah, I think it comes here. Does it show now? No, not yet. Oh, yes. Great. Thank Fabulous. you. I'm sorry, sorry about Thank that. You, very much. you will just see the screen. Don't worry if you don't see yourself. I'll be telling you when five minutes yeah. are left. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Arabel. Uh, maybe you should look at it and put it in presentation mode. Yes. 
do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this warm welcome uh, to the uh, Italian AOM Academy of Management, the Synergy SEMA Management Conference in Pisa. I would have loved to be there with you. I've been looking very much forward to this speak and it's a big honor to be invited to uh, talk about something that I think is of uttermost importance for the global challenges. And it may be seen on a daily basis as this is just talk because what I'm going to talk about is communication and CSR communication or if you like, how we speak about sustainability, sustainable development, and including the sustainable development goals, which is something I work with on a daily basis in my job as head of prime with the UN Global Compact. So what I'm, what I'm doing right now in my current job is actually what this, the theme of this conference very much has to do with how we as universities engage with businesses to advance sustainable development. And an important dimension of that is the communication. This is what I've been researching on for the past 15 years. Uh, so is how do we frame, how do we inspire each other? How do we engage in the global challenges? Uh, and, and how do we, uh, by words, actually set new agendas, hide some agendas, emphasize others and focus on those agendas that are topical or of particular importance in our region of the world or in a particular time uh, of the world. As we know, sustainable development is uh, an, an emergent phenomena and what we focused on and what we talked about 20 years ago is not the same that we talk about and that we focus on today. So I am uh, here focusing very much on the uh, ideas uh, that are to do with speaking and silence of uh, communication on uh, corporate social responsibility. And I, I want to uh, emphasize in this speak today on the two opposing forces that a lot of businesses are experiencing this day. And that is, on the one hand, there is an increasing demand to articulate and document your CSR activities. So we see that from big uh, multinational companies to their supplier, small and medium-sized enterprises. We see that expectation also in new EU Commission uh, requests and documents. We see that from the World Bank. We see that in a lot of nat national and international transnational institutions, the quest for business to articulate and document their CSR activities. And for good reasons. Uh, because there is a need for more transparency and to be able to actually see through what our businesses are contributing. But on the other hand, and this is something that I've been engaging with a colleague of mine, Professor Laura Spence, for quite some years now, we also see, and in particular, when we look upon small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, we also see that there is a respect and trust in living and being the CSR values that there is a, another dimension about not speaking about your CSR activities, but rather doing them and actually living your values. So we've been interested for quite some while in this dichotomy on these two opposing forces that seem to be uh, presented to, be, to businesses, and in particular to small and medium-sized enterprises. So our interest is here in really how do businesses engage uh, in between these two opposing forces. And we refer to this as implicit and explicit uh, communication. And if we look upon uh, the research, there is over the past 10, 15 years, a strong research that has developed on CSR communication, focusing very much on the spoken word, on the written word, on uh, documentations, on standards, on labels, and how we advance CSR and sustainable development by emphasizing on communication. And I'm just mentioning a few uh, of the illustrative examples on CSR communication research. I think it's fair to say that CSR communication research is today an elaborate field of research. What is less uh, a sort of um, researched into, and this is also a, an encouragement to, to you to sort of, uh, who may be interested in these areas, to explore into the future. What is less looked into is sort of organizational uh, talk that is um, 
uh, you say sort of more implicit and more silent, you say organizational silent talk. And I was looking through some of the references and some of the literature in, in my work with Laura Spence, and we were looking upon these two um, sort of uh, really good uh, and, and insightful pieces of research uh, from Administrative Science Quarterly and, 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 and in Academy of Management Review. And interestingly, both these references and with them others also uh, regard silence in a quite critical tone. So silence is often treated as something we would like to avoid. We would like people to speak. Sometimes in the research, it is almost as if the more you, you talk about your CSR, the better. And we sort of question that based on our uh, empirical work and our uh, over a long time with, in particular, as I said, small and medium-sized enterprises. Because it seems like uh, small and medium-sized enterprises have a preference for what we here label implicit CSR communication. And that has m very much to do with the values, often the values of the founder of the small and medium-sized enterprise. It has very much to do with the ethos uh, of his or her personal uh, integrity. It has very much to do with the family that's owning and running the, the small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, communication is often informal dialogue uh, with local partners and with stakeholders. It's got something to do with uh, being there more than talking about it. So in our empirical study, we, we met quite a few owner managers that were, that were sort of saying, I don't want to talk about this. I mean, I feel embarrassed about telling how many disabled people I'm actually helping in my, in my uh, shop or in my uh, organization. Or it doesn't matter uh, to sort of talk about how I actually engage in the local community, helping by, you know, avoiding pollution, uh, because this is something I do, because that is just the way I am, that is what I believe in. So even sort of measuring, you could say, and communicating about the CSR action in terms of how does it relate to uh, the, the financial advancement of, of the organization was less important for many of the small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, so, but yet, on the other hand, these uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, these owner managers, are at the same time more and more encouraged to, uh, and some even you could say, uh, not just encouraged but also regulated uh, and uh, asked to specifically by their multinational uh, customers to report on what they actually do. So they need to talk about their CSR action. They need to show codes of conduct and how they comply with those codes of conduct. And they need to uh, align with certain standards and certifications. And in, in a number of countries right now, um, the, there has been sort of regulatory frameworks developed to direct and guide CSR communication, which has very much focused on the larger firms. What we see today is a new regulatory framework that is being explored these days to see how can also the small and medium sized enterprises be helped and guided to communicate on their CSR uh, communication. So uh, we've been asked by the, some of our colleagues and the local network of Global Compact in Denmark to discuss uh, with them in a new study we're doing right now on small and medium sized enterprises. How do we ensure that those new guidelines are actually helpful for small and medium-sized enterprises and not just copying the guidelines from the multinational uh, company guideline. So we are, we are sort of interested in this, you could say, we, we, we call it these opposing forces. On the one hand, the need for more talk for the SMEs. On the other hand, also an appreciation of the silence that we call it here, or the implicit uh, CSR communication that seems to be uh, very important for uh, SME owner managers. In our paper in human relations uh, that we published last year, we developed the framework and I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but just to show that uh, we were sort of inspired by Foucaultian uh, research, uh, talking about the, you could say, sort of the governmentality of how uh, the quest for CSR communication, explicit CSR communication uh, is occurring in policy strategies, in compliance with standards, uh, in integration of external standards, into operational practice for the SME on the one side. On the other side, we have what we call the dynamics of implicit CSR communication, uh, which has much, very much to do with what I uh, was folding out before, 
the personalized word of mouth for the SME, the mutual trust. You don't need to write things down. You don't need to have big agreements. You trust each other. Uh, and also the, the sort of this, the family standing in the local community and very much what we could call a values-based leadership style. And in between these two dynamics, you could say of explicit CSR communication and implicit CSR communication, we identified a number of what we here refer to dilemmas or governmentality dilemmas where the SME finds uh, him, him or herself. This is about authenticity. So what we experienced in our empirical study was that owner managers um, often experience being sort of exposed to both the explicit and implicit demands <clears throat> that they are sort of selling out of their authenticity if they have to put their values and their CSR action into formalized uh, labels and into formalized schemes that they have not themselves um, uh, sort of produced. They talk about a, a values control that somebody else is telling them what to report on and not themselves deciding what are the most important values for their business. So they, they sort of talked about a kind of what we hear label identity disruption, that they were challenged on their integrity by having to almost market their values uh, and not just living them. So we were sort of interested in the, 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 the CSR talk versus what we here label the CSR silence uh, and that indeed there are some positive aspects of both and also some negative aspects of both. And that goes both for internal and external um, sort of um, the implications. So we uh, developed this, um, this uh, conceptual framework and we are still working on putting in some empirical evidence to, to check, test if this is um, uh, also makes sense for small and medium-sized owner managers. So what we see here, and I will start with uh, the negative implications for the CSR talk and CSR silence put out here in gray. So if we look upon the CSR talk uh, for external audiences where a company is talking about uh, doing something uh, good for the grand challenges of, of society. Uh, that, that may be seen for the SME manager, SME owner manager is often afraid that this may be seen as uh, overpromising or greenwash, you could say, that there may be some kind of hypocrisy in the statement if you do not live up to uh, what you say completely 100% uh, by, by the words. It may also be seen uh, from um, a, an internal perspective. Sorry, I wrote external here on the uh, last, on the corner uh, in the uh, left hand. It should have been internal, of course. It may also by employees be seen as you are over promising. So in the small and medium sized enterprise, uh, if the owner manager talks about the values uh, that the organization is working with, it may be seen as over promising. It may even stimulate, as, as some talked to us about, it may even stimulate a kind of an organizational wrongdoing if you are prom promising to do a little more than you're actually doing today. Uh, employees may be um, feeling a pressure to actually overperform in a way that is not. We've, for example, seen that in the, in the case of Volkswagen, where it, uh, there was a discussion about that some of the engineers in Volkswagen were actually inclined to perhaps even uh, do wrong in the organization in order to live up to managers' uh, promises. So that over-promising uh, risk is, is a very big worry and concern for SME uh, companies and SME in, in small and medium-sized enterprises. So on the other hand, the, uh, the, the silence of, um, of not saying anything about CSR, yeah. not, not wanting to communicate about uh, your CSR uh, activities is something that has been touched a, a bit upon in, re in, in prior research. For example, the ethical implications uh, or negative sense of CSR silence is a kind of self-censorship. That if you don't um, want to speak about your CSR, you, you don't want to discuss it internally because you cannot discuss it because uh, you know what is right, so there's no need to discuss with your organization or with your managers, could we do this differently? 
because the CSR action has become almost, you could say, a holy grail, we know this is the right way. We don't need to discuss this. Discuss this. Of course, there's a strong, you could say, sort of um, value in, in that belief, but that may also impose upon the organization a kind of an ethical closure where you are not uh, willing to discuss and not willing to advance and critique uh, what you are already doing. It may turn into a self-censorship. Then there may also be an external implication. If you're not saying anything, you may actually uh, raise um, quests for, are you hiding something? Uh, why don't you talk about, why don't you talk about your action and why don't you become more transparent uh, about what you're actually doing? So that is part of the, the push on small, medium-sized enterprises. If they're not talking enough, they may risk run suspicion or raise suspicion about uh, doing too little. On the positive side, on the on the on the talk uh, of, commun of CSR communication, we uh, see that for external purposes, uh, th this may be an opportunity for for businesses to actually show a very desirable and attractive image to the external world, whether this is customers, whether this is uh, public authorities, or it may even be uh, you, uh, your your local community. That has been very much, I would say, that is probably where we see most of the research in, in that box right now, uh, today. There's also some positive impl implications for uh, for internal purposes. And we, I've, I've myself worked on this uh, with a phenomenon we label aspirational talk, which is very much about um, mobilizing uh, management and also mobilizing your organization to uh, say something that is pr perhaps a little little bit more than where you actually are right now. So you're actually promising to, to do better than what you are today with the risk of being uh, accused of hypocrisy, but still on the other hand, from a positive perspective, this may actually raise uh, the bar and may make sure that you are moving ahead towards betterment of the organization's actions. The CSR silence, which is the last one I'm touching about here in a positive sense, is where I think that there is a lot more to be said and a lot more research uh, to be done that could be particularly interesting looking upon a small and medium-sized um, enterprise perspective. The new research has talked about green hushing uh, as a positive uh, implication of being silent about your CSR communication. And, and in the argument here is that there is a kind of a CSR fatigue. And uh, the case was uh, in, in the green hushing uh, paper that was published a couple of years ago. The, the um, example here was that when you go for a vacation, uh, you do not want to be feel guilty or be reminded all the time about that you should do better. So you simply, uh, so some agencies, travel agencies are, are offering you a, you could say a package where you, they ensure that once you are work, traveling with us, then everything we do is at the best of sustainable development. But we don't tell you to uh, that we are doing it. We don't remind you every day that this is why you bought this uh, holiday, but we are actually just making you know that we are doing the right thing here to uh, advance um, sustainable development. And that's a hush that is a kind of a low uh, key way of, you could say, non-communicating or in this vocabulary, a way of silencing, but still doing uh, the CSR activity. And of course, here, yeah, it's, a, it's a very high degree of trust uh, that management is working on. The, uh, the final one for, that I want to mention here on the silence in a positive, uh, in a positive sort of spirit is the being. And that, has, that is very much what we found in our study with the owner managers that, and I mentioned this already, that they really prefer to be, to live the values, to know that they are socially responsible, uh, to be authentic, you could say, instead of bragging about uh, how good they are and what they've been doing uh, so far. So they would uh, feel that their integrity is uh, challenged if they should market uh, their values. So we are now exploring um, what what is sort of, you could say, the um, what are some of the um, uh, performativities of being silent about your CSR uh, work? And our reason for doing this is simply to 
make sure that when the new regulatory frameworks for to help to be helpful for SMEs are being developed, that there is also an appreciation of this silence that we are not uh, completely overruling the small and medium sized enterprises with the same kind of regulatory framework that uh, we uh, see helpful for larger firms. So basically, on a concluding note here, my two main takeaways uh, for, for my talk here today is that perhaps we should consider the performativity of silence in organizations. And my focus on, has been on small and medium sized enterprises, but perhaps uh, that we could, uh, we could think of organizations in general. My other takeaway here today is sort of how we balance the talking and the silencing, which is indeed an underexplored management challenge uh, that uh, I see a lot of new research uh, that could be very helpful uh, to understand this uh, dichotomy or these dilemmas that organizations are uh, experiencing these days. So um, yes, doesn't mean that CSR uh, silence is the way forward only. It's very important for me, of course, to say that I'm interested in, and I think we should be more interested in the balancing because of course, talk is necessary to increase transparency for business. No mm -hmm. doubt about that. But uh, CSR is not just not only performed when we talk about it. Uh, and when we do it, there's also something about the silencing that uh, I think is underexplored so far. And silence does not necessarily mean inaction or passivity. Silence may also be an indication of another type of performativity that we know very little about um, today. So thank you very much. And thank I'm you, Mette. And thank you also for being so uh, precise in your times. I didn't interrupt you because it was just perfect. Thank you for uh, illustrating this fabulous study on the nuances of voice, but also of silence. Very inspiring indeed. Let me now pass the word to Philip Shapira, and then we will have a wrap up and questions in the end if we have time. So uh, Professor Shapira will be sharing with us a presentation by the title, The Next Research University Towards Sustainable Value Creation. Philip, could you I'll pass the question? If you need any help, let me know. Um, can you see? Uh, uh, no, not yet. Yes, we are right now. Perfect. If you uh, press on the center of the, no, no, press in the center of the screen. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. We can see it. Thank you. I um, I learned from Mete. It's the, maybe the first time both of us have used this uh, particular system. Um, so thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, Actually, I, in, in 2019, I had planned to be in Pisa uh, around the time visiting the Scuola Normale. Um, I'm working with you and uh, perhaps speaking at this conference, and uh, I even purchased my tickets. Uh, 2020, of course, it all got cancelled. Um, please, like, we can join uh, electronically. And in 2021, I'm hoping that Ryanair might actually give me my money back. I and mean, that's a kind of a bit of a <laughs> So it will be a two-year uh, long process. So I'm going to talk about the next research university uh, within this theme of grand challenges, companies and universities working together for a better society. I think this, um, this is a really important dialogue. Um, in my talk, I'm going to focus you know, on the higher end, on the grand challenges, and perhaps if we have time, we can get into the details. But as I was thinking about this, uh, how to structure it. So the research university, um, it's, where were we um, in 2019? The second part of my talk is where are we now? in uh, the September, six months um, into this pandemic. And the third talk is where should or must we go uh, as we go forward into the next uh, period? And I will highlight challenges for universities, business and government. Uh, perhaps the first thing to say is, um, you know, 
what defines a, a research university? Um, of course, many universities um, self-define themselves as research universities, and, and that's fine. Um, but some broad senses is that the university is engaged in creative activity, uh, basic uh, and applied research. It's undertaking education uh, with research-led teaching. There's a strong um, graduate research program, uh, or in the UK we would call that postgraduate of, uh, of masters, PhDs, uh, postdocs, which are kind of developing the next uh, generation of people who will work both in universities and in companies and in government. That the research university has a range of disciplines uh, with multiple schools and particularly with um, institutions and organizations, centers that can bring different disciplines together. Uh, research universities also perhaps defined by engagement with business and government communities in triple and quadruple helix approaches. And that research universities, um, whether they're public or private, um, generally uh, want to take on uh, and do take on leadership missions um, in developing research, education, and uh, engagement. How many research universities are there in the world? Well, all different ways of, of counting this. Uh, this table on the right is from the QS World University Rankings. Um, they identify just over 900 research universities that have very high or high research intensity, but they're somewhat clustered. Of course, we can always critique these rankings, but in this particular ranking, uh, the US has um, the most, uh, with, with the UK, Germany, Japan, and then China uh, has been rising up in the number of its uh, research universities. But it is clustered. I mean, it's essentially OECD countries plus China, and you have to go quite a ways down the table before you can find research universities on this measure, which are uh, in, the south, in the south or in uh, emerging economies. Well, uh, I gave you the positive sense of what is a research university, but you know, particularly for those who work in them, you know, there's another side to the research university. The, um, uh, the, the disciplinary um, infighting that goes on in universities, the resistance to change, the, the self-centered uh, ivory towers, and in fact, many, uh, many businesses you know have this kind of a perspective uh, on these large research universities it's not really for them they're for what they want to do uh, of course that's something that we should change uh, in uh, michael crow and uh, bill debar's book on designing the new american university uh, which is about the changes that they're attempting to introduce at arizona state university they talked about two key challenges of research universities. One was filio pietism. Um, when I first read that word, I had to go look it up, but it means the excessive veneration of tradition, you know, that we don't want to change because we've always done it this way. We have a school of this and a school of that, and that's how we've always done it. Or we have a tenure system, and that's how we've always done it. Um, so uh, this, this uh, resistance to change is a hallmark, uh, often of research universities. Uh, but Crow and Dunbar also highlight this, this issue of uh, isomorphism, where research universities, um, perhaps particularly those that are not in the top 10, uh, want to be in the top 10, and that they take these gold standard models of Harvard, uh, Oxford, Stanford, uh, all of which have massive endowments. Uh, as that's the only way a research university should be done. And that leads them to have selective admission, to emphasize research over teaching, to continually building uh, ever more fabulous uh, campus facilities. Um, but this also intensifies problems of, of access um, and the challenges of teaching and cost. Another aspect, particularly of the modern research university, uh, um, is the over managerial emphasis, the growth of corporate management uh, in research universities and the pressure to be driven by rankings and, and performance measurements. So um, 
two aspects to to the research university fact there's ideal goals and then kind of these challenges of actually making change and operation uh, in the university of course over time uh, universities do change uh, and they aspire to change and this kind of sequence comes from a paper uh, I published with a colleague in, in research policy uh, a few years back where we highlighted the journey that universities have, have taken from their original founding uh, in medieval times as, as storehouses of knowledge, you know, the library, the clerics, uh, being above society, the town and gown kinds of ideas. Um, those kinds of ideas um, are still very much around in modern universities, but they kind of go back uh, to the original founding. In the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, and particularly in the expansion of mass production in the 20th century, we had uh, the university as the knowledge factory. And we can think of the big um, American state land grant universities as kind of exemplars. I mean, massive, large campuses, students in, research money in, degree trained uh, graduates out, papers out, um, a kind of a mass production, large scale uh, operation. Um, <clears throat> today, uh, I think universities are seeking to evolve into this third model, maybe a post-industrial knowledge driven model, where they become hubs, they become um, intermediaries, uh, they become leaders in intelligent regions, they're promoting new capabilities. So they're move, trying to move beyond uh, supply and output and trying not to be elitist, but to be much more engaged uh, into uh, the environments in which they find themselves. Well, um, in what ways uh, have universities attempted to, um, you know, become knowledge hubs? And I'm and, and still where we were in, in 2019, and I think I can identify at least two major strategies. The first strategy was all about building global reach, building research alliances and facilities abroad, abroad international campuses, attracting large numbers of fee paying international students, uh, engaging with global companies and creating worldwide networks. Uh, we did a, uh, a study a couple of years ago on uh, international university research ventures and identified hundreds of these joint research ventures that major um, research universities had established in other countries to kind of build their global reach. I'll show a few pictures of them on the, on the right hand side. Contrasted with that, there's a kind of another um, nascent model perhaps hasn't received quite the funding and attention of the of the building global reach model. But this is the notion of making the university a socially responsible university to emphasize responsibility in research and in the ways in which innovation occurs to building um, a, a much more sustainable campus um, to engaging students in citizenship uh, both in their coursework and in reaching out to communities and in civic uh, engagement. Uh, I work at the University of Manchester, uh, which actually pursues both of these strategies. It has attempted to, uh, to, to, to build global reach, uh, but it's also put attention into social responsibility and has won awards um, for the programs and activities that it's undertaken. That's where we were in 2019. Uh, here's where we, uh, where we are today. So we've had this pandemic. Of course, the impacts vary significantly um, between different countries. So this is a, a kind of a broad sweep, uh, particularly on um, perhaps based on my U US and UK experience. Uh, but we see, um, Campuses closed and research labs closed, and, and they've been that way since March. Except, of course, uh, those labs working specifically on COVID-19. Other researchers have been working from home. Uh, this has led to uh, 
challenges of research productivity, although also some no opportunities. I'll say a few words about those. Uh, the cancelling of travel, although we've discovered uh, Zoom and, and other conferences. Uh, I think particular challenges for early career researchers in terms of their mentoring. Um, to to um, uh, we, uh, even I have some visiting researchers that have essentially spent their time in their bedrooms, and it's just been a very different environment. And of course, I try and engage with them, um, but for researchers that have to go into labs, it's been a big a big challenge. Uh, international students and international visitors particularly affected. Researchers that have family or caring responsibilities affected. We've had this huge um, uh, work in shifting our teaching online, which we did rapidly and now we're continuing to do with the new academic year. A lot of financial uncertainty, staff uncertainty. Uh, I don't have any specific numbers on this, but my sense is, is that there's been a drop in business engagement because businesses are, are attempting to survive uh, in COVID-19 rather than to launch uh, new projects with universities. And a lot of pressure on the credibility of science and the effectiveness of science advice. Many science advisors uh, to governments are coming out of universities, and I think it's been a very difficult moment. Um, perhaps some of these pictures sum it up. You know, the professor teaching online without any students and the scientists without a lab um, and how can they operate in, in this environment. So it's been extremely challenging. Uh, I should mention that there have been a few uh, silver linings and perhaps we can learn from some of these. Um, COVID-19, of course, has been this natural experiment where a lot of economic business um, activity has been closed down. Um, and so for some researchers, particularly uh, working at an atmospheric science or looking at uh, whales um, in the oceans where there are just far fewer ships or looking at urban mobility during periods where uh, there really wasn't any traffic, um, these have been incredible periods to kind of make observations. So there's some silver lining there. Uh, I think that we've seen in the COVID-19 area across all the domains of epidemiology, therapy, drugs, vaccines, massive growth, massive effort, uh, massive increases in, in output. So we've shown that um, researchers can rise uh, to these challenges. Uh, one of the interesting things is the massive growth of open publishing, the boost to, to preprinting, which in medical domains was perhaps not as large as what it has been in some other domains, such as computer science, but it's really grown massively. And we may not, um, uh, that, that genie in a way is out of the bottle, both with the difficulties, but also some of the advantages of using uh, open publishing. Uh, a lot of innovation in diagnostics and machines and apps. And, um, the Zoom conference and the workshop, and maybe uh, we knew about this before, but perhaps we didn't quite do it, but is there now a, a more sustainable alternative to the massive amounts of travel that many academics uh, did previously? But the pan pandemic is not over, and there's still a lot, of a lot of uncertainty. So I think we're in a phase now, certainly in the universities that I, I know well, where we're beginning to ramp up in terms of research. So the labs are reopening, uh, mostly at around 50% uh, in shift work by appointment. And in one particular lab I know very well, a large biotech lab, researchers can only go in at designated times, socially distanced, undertake experiments. They cannot use desks. They can't use offices. So there's like no sit down work your data, you collect the data, you have to go analyze it uh, back at home. Um, so this is, this is challenging. So there's a slow return to work, there are added costs. I think it's still very difficult for international researchers and students to travel in the way that they were previously. And we are um, undertaking online teaching and I've seen uh, the efforts to teach in class and do hybrid Many of them have now been rolled back very quickly to a fully online 
teaching in the next uh, semester. Uh, at some point, uh, we may go, perhaps this will be in 2021 in the spring, to what we could call the new pandemic normal, where the labs will be much closer to their full operation. There still might be some slow return to work and shielding. I think we're going to find challenges in some areas, for example, in clinical trials, uh, even in non-COVID-19 areas, it might be difficult to enroll um, uh, volunteers uh, into these trials. Uh, there's lots of issues about how we're going to adjust for the impacts on researchers where they've gone through perhaps six months, nine months a year when it was when they were not fully productive. How should that, that affect their tenure and promotion and review possibilities? Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to resume uh, university business relationships, not only with joint R&D, but a big area, and this has been particularly felt in Manchester, we send lots of students, research students, to industrial placements, and that has just been completely closed down uh, this year. So we hope that that may uh, continue. Of course, um, even in the new normal, we may need to ramp back down to a much lower um, capability if the virus respikes again. So there's just a lot of uncertainty here. There's lots of issues, um, kind of bigger issues. I mean, there's this global um, R&D geopolitics kind of issues. They're particularly sharp between the US and China, um, where after a period of, um, uh, of exchange alliances, uh, the two now view one another with suspicion. Um, and there's a lot of clamping down, particularly from the US perspective, on um, Chinese researchers in the US. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not sure I'd like to be a Canadian researcher in China at the moment. So China is also flexing its own muscles. So we have that kind of challenge to um, kind of free movement from an R&D perspective. We have these other challenges, the UK, EU, the US, EU, um, how Europe is going to relate to China, the North-South. So this notion of kind of frictionless global university research alliances, I think now kind of comes into question and the free mobility of researchers and their prospects perhaps also comes into question. Uh, another area is how will the massive costs, um, you know, we've yet to count the full costs of COVID-19, the huge amounts of monies that have been borrowed, how will they affect R&D budgets? Uh, in some countries, it seems like um, perhaps not much change. And in fact, some countries, particularly the US and the UK, are going to expand their budgets, but there might be more focus on applied research. Other countries uh, may restrict R&D budgets. So it's an unknown question. Uh, also unknown, um, open publishing, will that continue at a higher level? Uh, is virtual networking here to stay? Um, maybe there be, will be positive lesson, lessons about the rapid approaches to drug uh, research, which have been undertaken between universities and companies. Maybe there are some new models that I'm not saying that we're not going to go through full testing, but there may be some new models to kind of accelerate and to collaborate in the way in which we do drug uh, research. From the university business perspective, and perhaps this is targeted particularly country, to countries like the, the UK and perhaps the US, uh, the reliance on the continued growth of fees from international students uh, wanting to do research degrees at your university, maybe that's a model uh, that's now into uh, question. Uh, how we can be more resilient as institutions uh, is now an issue. Um, how are we going to continue with online education, uh, which actually is as expensive almost as regular education, but students don't feel they want to pay as much for it, so there's a kind of a challenge. Uh, how we can shift not only to global, but also to local challenges. So Philip, can I ask you one, one or two minutes to... Uh, okay. okay, so uh, just to kind of uh, wrap up, I think, for research universities, um, the pandemic is around, but uh, we but we still have these big challenges, and and they're neatly uh, captured in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. All of these are around here. Uh, we've gone through an incredible shock, but we need to 
rethink how we're going to put these challenges back uh, onto our research agenda. I think for government, we need to think about how uh, to de-emphasize narrow measures and to re-emphasize the broader public missions of research universities. Of course, address immediate financial problems, but perhaps review the way the funding models and the business models of, of research universities and play their role in emphasizing the value of international research collaborations. And for business, besides their own immediate survival, how to rebuild projects and links with universities, um, how to partner with universities on research at societal frontiers and em embrace responsible research and innovation models. Uh, so uh, for the next research university, uh, I guess the challenge is how can research universities reimagine themselves? So, so I think we, need, we will need, and maybe we're doing this now, is reflect on our performance during this COVID-19 period. Uh, what lessons have we learned about how we do research, how we treat our staff, how we engage with our students and broader communities? But um, more fully, how can we re-engage with the world? How can we reopen? and uh, reorientate to these sustainable development challenges? How can we be inclusive, uh, measured by who we include, not, ex not by who we exclude? How we can develop our global partnerships, but also our local and civic partnerships, and how we can value research that's not only basic and, and uh, blue sky, but also research that has impact on these sustainable development challenges. And so maybe I kind of come back to this model I showed you earlier, the, of this nascent two model of the socially responsible university that hopefully COVID-19 has emphasized the importance of this model and the need to give it more attention in addition to our global reach models and our other ways of trying to engage with universities. So with that, um, Thank you for the time, and I'll be very uh, willing to engage with you in uh, responding to any questions. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, that was really inspiring, and all the detail about the evolution of universities and what we're living today, and also what's coming up in the future. So thank you, uh, both of you. We have a little bit of time for questions. We started late, so we're going to finish a little bit later. We have uh, one question has arrived for Mette, which I would like to uh, share with her. I have one question each. So for Mette, they're asking, could you elaborate on where linguistic linguistic obfuscation would be located in your conceptual framework where companies are developing developing sophisticated ways to talk while at the same time they silence on important issues so whereabouts do you think that would end be in your framework yes no thank you very much for for this uh, truly important uh, question because um of course, some of the issues that are silenced, I mean, in, 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 need to be sort of spoken about. And we, of course, know that in strategic CSR communication, part of the strategy for many, or for some businesses, I would say, is, of course, hiding certain issues by overemphasizing other deeds that the organization has engaged in. So I would put that, uh, if I understand your your. Uh, the question correct, uh, I would of course put that in the sort of the, the negative with the potential of actually um, being explored to get into a language that could be then um, more transparent and be talked about in the future. But I think that what is most important, uh, what, what we have seen in our work is sort of the balancing between these negative, positive, between these voicing and silencing of different uh, issues for SMEs. Um, and I think that uh, sort of also one particular thing, and I think that that we've seen that in in other research as well, that the pusher, if the push to SMEs uh, to uh, over be over linguistic, you could say, in their uh, in their communication on CSR, and to sort of report on issues where they feel uncomfortable, and where they may have to over promise in order to get a certain customer to actually uh, per, per, pursue or purchase. Uh, with them as as the as the uh, as the supplier, for example, is that uh, there is a lot of cheating going on. 
So you can actually see, for example, uh, read some of research of some of our colleagues and with also with Loris Fens and, and others have, have looked into how some of these uh, SMEs are then hiding um, their non complicitness uh, with what they have actually promised once they are visited by a, a controller in the, in the manufacturing unit. Uh, but they have actually written down, they promised they want to do that, but they are not. But they only promise, they only write, put into words, because that is a request uh, by the uh, multinational uh, uh, purchaser. So we are sort of very interested in how do we not over request uh, the SME with demands uh, to complicit where they simply cannot perform and which will then lead to some kind of obviously, cheating or, or underperforming in, in terms of. So how do we make sure when we want to advance, we want to help these SMEs and very often they want to advance, how do we then make sure that regulatory framework does not become a new new sort of frame that is too tight uh, and is not helpful uh, in, in any way. So I'm not sure I sort of uh, responded exactly to, to your very good question here, um, but uh, that's part of sort of where, where we come from and what we think is hugely important when we are balancing and we want to pay more attention from research, but also from the voices in practice to this, these dilemmas. Thank you. Okay, there's just one one more question, Mette, for you before I pass the word to Philip. We have we still have a couple of minutes. Is the question of authenticity? How can uh, uh, companies maintain the uh, the authenticity in their talk without being lost in time? Yes, just, and just, I'll ask you just a couple of minutes, so I have time to ask Philip a question too. Very, very. Uh, I would say thank you very much, uh, Chiara Dipanati, for this uh, very good question and and a uh, the difficult question uh, to answer very quickly because I think it is it is it's a very good observation, and uh, and we also know that. Um, the authenticity, for example, in a relationship in, in a couple, uh, a man and a husband uh, being married, is not everything that you know or that you feel about your partner that you want to put into words, because that may actually sort of destroy the authenticity in that relationship uh, and in destroy some of the value in that relationship. At least that's what, that's what my husband tells me. So, you know, I think that there is the, the, it is a very, very valid uh, question that you're raising here how do you make sure that you sort of um, uh, keep on uh, appreciating that authenticity and not selling out of it when you when you put that into words and i think that is that is some of the things that uh, that laura spence and i worked with and we try to put attention to uh, in our article uh, but i like the way you frame the question here so thank you very much for that Thank, Thank you, you. Mette, for answering and keeping it, you know, to the point. So let me pass the word, uh, a question to Philip, if possible. And the question is this, many universities are now hosting green offices and embracing the 2030 SDG agenda. But it remains unclear, and I think you also talked to this when you were concluding your remarks, how exactly can companies, uh, universities uh, go to this, uh, 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 you know, above just planting trees when maybe the local communities are resistant to this uh, kind of interaction with universities, maybe for ideological reasons or lack of budget. So how can universities help this process within the local communities? And could there be resistances? Um, thank you. Um, of course, universities have the same challenges I think Mate uh, highlighted with, uh, with large companies. So universities do set up um, visions and strategies and offices, uh, but uh, they talk the talk, but are they walking the walk? Are they actually doing it in their practices? And universities um, you know, have many, many, many moving, moving parts. Um, the parts of uh, research and teaching uh, tend to have be given much greater priority than the sustainability missions. Um, so there's that kind of um, internal um, challenge of making uh, these sustainability missions, you know, throughout all of the organization. But um, in um, relationship to local communities, um, I mean, that's a really interesting question and there's a long um, history to this. I mean, it turns out that uh, many research universities, particularly true in the UK and um, uh, in the US, if they're not, if they are not old medieval universities, but if they are 
modern universities are often located uh, in the city and they're surrounded by communities. And the history of the university has often been to just demolish those communities and kind of expand their buildings and facilities. So there's a kind of a, a tension, a historic tension. So I think universities have to uh, work with communities, you know, where they are, where they are. They can't kind of preach to communities. They have to kind of engage with communities. They have to listen to communities. They have to see what their problems are to see if there are projects and activities that they can engage with them um, and build up trust and confidence over a period of time, um, including around sustainability issues, but also around poverty and employment and health and, and opening up access uh, you know, to their courses and their facilities. So there are a variety of ways in which universities uh, can engage with communities. Um, uh, you know, but they should first of all listen to communities and work out um, the ways in which they, they can be more, more, most useful to them. It shouldn't be something coming from an office, you know, that's directing. Okay, so thank you very much indeed for this, uh, for this wonderful conversation. We've gone a little bit over time, but it was well worth it. And it, it was a great pleasure to have you both with us. Um, let me invite the people who are following us uh, to uh, take a lunch break at the moment and to reconnect again at two when we have a meeting with a plenary session with businesses to talk about the best practices. And again, let me thank both Mette and Philip for the most inspiring conversations or for having managed to link both presentations uh, so, so fabulously. So thanks again for your insights and for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.